Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 57 of Ask the CEO with Avram Gatile. Today, I'd like to introduce a very special guest. He is the CEO of IoT One, a leading source of information and insight regarding industrial Internet of Things vendors and solutions, where he helps companies develop their customer bases, partner ecosystems, and innovation strategies. He is also the chair of the Industrial Internet Consortium, Smart Factory Task Group, and the Shanghai Director of Startup Grind, where he works with IIC members to reduce risk for early adopters of industrial IoT technologies in manufacturing. Through Startup Grind, he supports the development of Shanghai's innovation ecosystem. It is my pleasure to welcome Eric Walenza. Welcome, Eric. Yeah, thank you for hosting me. Yeah, thank you so much for joining. Whereabouts are you, by the way? I am in the center of Shanghai, near People Square. Wow, wow. You know, I, I don't know if this is just me. I mean, I find it fascinating talking to people globally. I mean, it's the end of your day, the beginning of my day. And, you know, we're on opposite ends of the globe. doing We're doing the same things just at different times of the day. Exactly, yeah. Thanks, thanks Skype and Zoom and all the companies that have... Uh, <laughs> made this possible, right? 10 years ago, uh, or maybe 15 years ago, in any case, it was not really on the agenda. Exactly. And, you know, which is such a perfect segue into what we wanted to talk about today, which is industrial IoT. So, you know, there's so much uh, publicity going on for things like smart cities and government IoT and smart homes and the consumer IoT. Um, The industrial IoT seems to be getting some attention nowadays as well. What are your thoughts about how, uh, how things are working with the industrial IoT? Yeah, it's so funny. I also hosted a, a podcast this morning, so <laughs> we're, we're, uh, we're kind of uh, trading, uh, trading jobs there. But this was one of the topics that we discussed. And um, the, the opinion of the guy that I was speaking with was that we're in um, – the early years. We're in the first years of a, a 20, 30 year cycle. And so I would say industrial IoT is still very early. Um, I, my feeling is that industrial IoT is going to mature into a sizable business more rapidly than um, smart cities or consumer uh, because it, you know, there's a clearer value proposition, right? So Companies are better able to build a you know a coherent business um, business plan around how can I keep my factory running longer? Right? Um, cities, you have more politics involved. The mayor wants to get reelected, so he'll you know push the money into a program, but um, there might not be as coherent a, a long term plan there to make sure that succeeds. And then on consumer side, um, people might buy something because it's interesting, but until we start providing you know let's say moving through the early adopters to the, the majority and providing solutions that are built for them, I think that's not going to scale. And that, that seems to be a bit, uh, you know, a bit off. Um, so I'm quite bullish on, let's say, the industrial IoT in the coming years. I think uh, one metric or <laughs> data point that we look at a little bit subjectively, but what are the topics around conferences? What, you know, what's the theme of conferences? And really in 2015-16, a lot of conferences were about what is the industrial IoT, what is IoT, what is Industry 4.0, and we had all these charts of you know step one, you know okay we've got uh, steam and, and da da da, and now we're we're attaching the internet. So uh, walking people conceptually through the the thought process, and now we're at the point where people say okay I get it. Now tell me what have you done? What problems did you experience? What were the benefits? And uh, I want to understand if I can actually implement this. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, one of the trends that I've seen in consumer IoT that's starting to spill over into industrial IoT. And, you know, I I believe that you're correct about how it's going to pick up steam because of the clear value proposition. Um, But what, you know, one of the areas that I've seen spilling over is a term called conversational commerce, which in the consumer IoT, if you think about the refrigerators, uh, the smart refrigerators that Amazon is making that can restock your milk um, when, when it runs low on milk, 
Um, if you think about it in the industrial IoT setting, you have an assembly belt where the motor is starting to wear out. So your industrial IT solution will uh, order a new motor and, and the supervisor comes into the office in the morning, just finds a box on his desk and goes, oh, I guess we're doing maintenance. Yeah, that's a great example. And, and that's a great example of a, a consumer use case where, you know, I'm not actually sure that there's a, a real robust need for that. You know, as a consumer, I'm not sure that I would actually, I actually want my fridge to buy milk. You know, <laughs> the fridge also know the context around, am I traveling? Did I get milk before? You know, like um, there's context around that. Um, so there's a lot of room for, for error because human behavior, consumer behavior is quite uh, you know, diverse. And also are people willing to pay a premium for, you know, yeah. for this solution where the internet is already pretty convenient there for, for solving that problem. But on the business side, people definitely want, you know, the uh, yeah, spare part or the consumables to be delivered on demand when, you know, when they're needed. Uh, that's a known need. Um, people are already spending money trying to solve that. And so if a better uh, mousetrap comes to market, you know, I think it will be sold. Yeah, for sure. Now, let's take a minute and focus on IoT One. So what does what exactly does IoT One do and who does it serve? Yeah, so, you know, we say high level our goal is accelerating adoption of industrial iot solutions uh, the the big adoption barrier that we're addressing is the knowledge gap so you've got let's say three percent of the the companies in the world that are bringing new technologies to market in the space and then you've got the other 97 percent of the economy including all the machine builders the the factory owners the device manufacturers and then you know retail and logistics companies, guys that are very far from the technology. And these guys are supposed to be using the technology. Um, and there's a, big, there's a big gap there. There's even a big gap between the highly technical companies that, you know, let's say a solar panel manuf manufacturer that has very deep expertise in electrical and mechanical engineering, but doesn't really have much expertise in IT. Right? Um, and so IoT One, our mission is to accelerate by number one, um, helping to bring products to market, helping to communicate the value in a, in a business friendly way. So not, not looking so much at the features, but, you know, looking at the benefits and, and, and also the costs and the challenges and, and you know, it, does this make sense for a particular uh, company? And then number two, helping to develop those products through co-innovation. So working typically with large um, traditional companies and connecting them with startups, faster moving companies that are able to experiment with new technologies and new business models. And there's a nice um, symbiosis there where the, um, the large company benefits by being able to move faster and be exposed to uh, new opportunities, new solutions. And the smaller company uh, has a benefit in terms of being able to commercialize things that they've developed, but um, you know, may you know, kind of face that valley of death challenge of actually getting the, the solution to market. So, um, so we work with you know, quite a few companies. We help... Uh, Small startups enter into China, for example. We also work with large companies like um, GE and PTC and so forth on um, global campaigns. Wow. Al, how do you find uh, the Chinese market uh, to be with regards to the industrial IoT? So China is an interesting market. I think, you know, imagine what, what we've seen, for example, in solar, in uh, wind turbines. So we see a technology that the government recognizes that this is a potentially disruptive technology, a technology, let's say a 21st century technology that may be re replacing a 20th century technology, right? Which would be oil and gas and, and coal and so forth. And they push uh, a lot of investment in because they understand that they're not going to be competitive in the 20th century technology, but in the 21st century, they might be competitive there if they make the right investments. Um, IoT is, is one of those. So the government has put it at a very high priority level. Um, I think the, the recent uh, supercomputer, um, you know, top uh, 500 just was released and uh, China took the first place from the US. So uh, they now have 202, I believe, of the, the top 500, um, including the two fastest, um, which are at least um, according to the, the high level, uh, you know, KPIs that they use to track them about five times faster than the next uh, competitor. So um, yeah, interesting market. The government has made this very high priority. There's a lot of money moving in through VCs, also uh, a lot of um, 
state-owned enterprises are receiving, you know, let's say um, subsidized loans in order to invest in pilot projects. Um, a lot of private companies are working with local governments to ramp up robotics production and, and to basically pivot from being a non-technology company to a more technology-oriented company. So it's, it's a little wild west. Uh, it's a little bit, um, you know, there's probably some money that isn't being allocated the most efficiently. But I think when we look back, we're going to say, wow, you know, 10 years from now, China is going to be, you know, number one, number two player in, in a lot of these markets. And we're going to say, well, you know, some of those bets paid off. Enough of those bets paid off that, um, that China is in a different position, not, not so much, let's say, the, the follower, the, the, the country where people say, um, you know, watch out about China copy new. It's more going to be what's happening in China. Great. Um, now, who would be an ideal client for IoT One? Yeah, so we we kind of divide our clients into three categories. So one would be uh, global go to market. So any um, you know large technology company that is releasing products or building out their um, partner ecosystem and wants to increase their their visibility, wants to um, identify potential customers or potential partners, technology or channel partners on a global scale. So that would be category number one and those would be global campaigns. Category number two would be um, startups that are specifically interested in entering into China and then we work with them on a very strategic level. We may even take equity in some circumstances um, and basically yeah, manage all of the, the challenges around entering into the Chinese market. So the administrative challenges around, you know, hiring and, and being able to actually conduct business here legally, um, the IT infrastructure challenges, getting your cloud up and so forth, and then helping to build out their channel ecosystem here. And very importantly, um, landing the first couple uh, Chinese customers so that they have those success cases. Um, and also that, you know, internally they're generating some revenue to justify the, um, the investment in building out China. So we try to, you know, reduce the risk and, and help companies to accelerate that process on a very like OPEX based uh, basis without you know, fixed investments. The third is working with more traditional companies, um, machine manufacturers and so forth, um, who are being threatened in their core markets because their product categories are being commoditized, right? And they're making some of these companies look like Caterpillar, um, making almost 100% of its uh, revenue by selling you know, things, very little service revenue, right? Um, so that's a, that's a very, threatened position because there's a lot of companies that, you know, have the capability to compete with Caterpillar on making these big pieces of equipment. Uh, it's not such a competitive differentiator. So working with companies like this to uh, differentiate, build out their, their service businesses around IT, um, build out differentiated business models. Um, so those would be the, the categories. Great. And, you know, it's such a wonderful thing that uh, startups have companies like IoT One that could actually help them get going. Uh, I, you know, one of the most valuable services that made an impression on me was, was the way you help them get those success cases uh, so that they can have press releases and be relevant in the industry. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that's <laughs> I'd say one of the biggest challenges right now is that a lot of companies, um, they lack you know, they just lack sec success cases, right? They're investing money in, um, in building solutions. Uh, they're, they're, you know, investing to, to get out to the market. Um, getting those first success cases is, uh, is a huge milestone because, um, you know, it's a, it's a big investment often from the startup perspective. They may have to invest a lot of resources in um, supporting this, this initial customer who's kind of taking the risk of working with them. Um, but end of the day, um, this is something they're going to bring into, you know, for the next year, every meeting, you know, if they, if they're able to say, I'm working with X, Y, Z, this is how I'm helping them. Um, here's the benefits that we've seen in the first, you know, two months uh, makes the, you know, the growth process exponentially easier. Yeah, for sure. Now we, uh, you had mentioned earlier that about how, how bullish you are on industrial IoT. What are some of the future trends uh, that you see uh, taking place over the next couple of years? Oh, let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, one trend that I think is quite interesting is this um, shift from focus on cloud to uh, more of an appreciation for edge computing. So, 
I, you know, I, I suppose largely kind of because of historical reasons, because the cloud has been relatively mature servicing, you know, financial, retail, these, these other sectors with more traditional IT um, challenges. We have pretty mature cloud infrastructure and, um, and then people are building IoT solutions based on cloud. But for industrial, there's a lot of challenges with working with the cloud, right? So you got to get your data up there. Uh, you've got to have confidence that you're going to have pretty much 24-7 connectivity, very little downtime in the system. Uh, you have to um, secure that pathway to the cloud. Um, you have, you know, if you're um, um, a, a time-based business where, where milliseconds can matter, right? So if you're, let's say, uh, self-driving cars or um, on a production line, you know, very tightly controlled production line, um, you can't have a, a delay. And, you know, we, we all know that the cloud is prone to, you know, delays that, you know, if you're in a telco, uh, if you're in a, in a conference call, not a big deal. You can deal with it. You know, if it's a production line, it can't, it can't cope with this, right? So um, I think edge computing is going to be a, a really breakthrough technology. You know, the, the costs of computer coming down, um, the cost of connectivity. And so things that were previously only possible in, either a you know kind of a large on-premise data center or by putting data up in the cloud because that's where the computing power was now companies are figuring out how to do those on the edge which means basically uh, in kind of a local compute environment maybe even a distributed environment across multiple devices that's actually out there on the operating environment you know on the equipment in in that environment um, and, and part of that is the hardware coming down the capabilities improving so they're able to, to actually get, you know, the compute power out there. And, uh, but a big part of that is companies figuring out smarter ways to, you know, to operate. So smarter ways to run algorithms where uh, maybe you're, you're pushing um, a percentage of that data up to the cloud to analyze it, but then, and, and optimize the algorithm uh, through updates, but then the, the algorithm is, is residing on the edge and that's where the, the work is getting done. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. So, Eric, how did you get started in this? I'm from a management consulting background, cost, uh, cost side, um, fairly traditional consultancy. So um, I would say working on interesting projects, but that kind of put a young person on a plane, send them out to somebody's office. Um, you know, every quarter you could be working on a radically different uh, project, um, different customer, different industry, different function. Um, so I suppose it, it, interesting, but um, for me, uh, I, you know, I, I kind of did a bit of a self analysis. Where am I really passionate about? What am I reading in the morning when I'm, uh, you know, drinking my coffee? And, uh, and this was it. So I said, well, how can I pivot, so to speak, to, to really focus on this area? Um, and I met a couple uh, guys that have been doing business. Uh, you know, I was also based in Shanghai at the time, met a couple guys that have been doing business for about 10 years here they were also interested in the space. And so we started talking to people and just analyzing what are challenges in growing this, um, you know, this technology domain and how could we potentially help to resolve those. And, and IoT one was kind of born out of that and a lot of future discussions and iterations. Nice. And what was your decision to uh, take this to market? We made a pretty big pivot actually early on in the company. When we first uh, started the company, we were trying to be um, more or less 100% online. So build up a platform where companies connect on the platform. And what we found was that we're in this very strategic phase of the industry where um, you know, thing, decisions are not being made by procurement managers and you know, often they're being made by business leaders. And there's a lot of strategic discussion around those because there's a lot of uncertainty around, you know, what's, you know, what's the right solution? What makes sense for us? What's even possible today? Who are the right partners? What are the risk factors, et cetera. And so we found that our platform was being used. It wasn't being used kind of transactionally to connect with a vendor and, and then just, um, you know, make a, um, you know, make an order, but it was being used as a, as a research and, you know, to identify companies for longer term discussions. And so we, we realized that we have to be part of those longer term discussions. And that means we have to be much more strategic around how we work with companies. And so um, we basically pivoted, you know, we, the website is still very important to us. Um, it's, it's our business card, so to speak. It's, uh, it's a research center that we use and a lot of our, um, you know, our, our community uses. Uh, but we, 
we've decided to focus much more on identifying a small group of companies with you know specific challenges, whether it's getting technology out to market and going really deep into those companies uh, to, to see how we can help them accomplish their goals. And then we'll see maybe um, as the industry matures, um, you know, IOT one, the website will turn a little bit more into an Alibaba type platform where companies, you know, are actually comfortable going on there and making, you know, somewhat transactional purpose, you know, purchases. Yeah. And, and you know, that, that's actually interesting. So uh, one of the things I love about what you tell me uh, about how IOT one serves the marketplace is that a need that I've seen in the industry is education. You know, people need educators and, and people need mentors and people need where to go to learn about things because technology is changing so rapidly. And yes, it's true that there are uh, videos out there on YouTube and there are forums out there, but many of those, if not all of them are commercialized and you can't go there without encountering either a call to action or some kind of a marketing message. So then the question is, well, are they truly objective and can I really trust what they're saying or are they just trying to get me to buy something? Um, however, having a platform where people can go to learn about the different technologies and actually get the business help that they need to help them thrive, that is something that I see as uh, becoming a greater need as more and more companies come out with new innovations. Yeah, and I, I agree completely. And, you know, I think this, uh, because of the, the phase we're in right now, this kind of shotgun approach to, uh, to marketing, um, I think there's a risk to it because the companies that are bringing the technology to market, they're, they're often not big companies, right? Um, and they can't afford to pursue a thousand different conversations with companies that are, you know, not, not really potential customers, that are maybe just doing a little bit of high-level research, brainstorming, you know, just trying to figure things out, uh, but maybe going to, going to act on it three years later. Um, this is, uh, this kind of bleeds, a, you know, a small technology to death because they, they always feel like uh, people are interested in what I'm doing and I'm just on the cusp of all these sales, but really they're just, um, they're just, you know, kind of high level educating people. So super important uh, for us to figure out how we can always be more focused, right? How we can really find a company that has some urgency has a you know a particular need has an idea what they're looking for and connect them with somebody that can really solve that problem because for the, both of those guys then you know within a reasonable amount of time they can actually help each other um, you know and this is a this is a challenge obviously for us it's a challenge for every company that's kind of bringing a new solution to market yeah exactly so Eric um, as you were building IOT one what were some of the challenges the ups and downs along the way. Let's put our downs into two <laughs> two buckets. So, uh, first six months was a bit of a uh, intellectual struggle, right? We were uh, relatively new to the space. I mean, I had some kind of let's say business management consulting experience in this, so high level uh, horizontal experience, uh, but I hadn't gotten deep into a lot of the areas. Uh, my partners had some experience, but also more from the business side. So it was a bit of a deep dive for us. Um, and it was just um, just a slog, you know, going through as many conversations as we can, trying to uh, trying to focus the business. Um, and then we felt like we found a couple, um, you know, a couple areas where we could really do do some real, you know, some good work and, and help some companies. Um, and we went about 12 more months without generating a single dollar of revenue. Right. So that was a bit painful. And part of that was that our focus was very much on building up the platform and, you know, we were devoting a lot of time to research and a lot of time to, you know, and hours to coding and so forth. So um, building up the infrastructure, but still you see the money going out and you, you're like, where's, you know, our runway. Unfortunately, my partners are very flexible. Um, so it was never so much a question of kind of running out of runway for us. Um, but emotionally, it's very hard to go through yes. this long period. And then eventually we decided, okay, we've got to now, you know, we feel like we're comfortable. We've, we've gotten to a point where, you know, we, uh, the website is at a point where we're comfortable with it. Our knowledge base, our, our network, our ability to, to help companies is at a point where we're, where we're comfortable. And we folk, you know, we shifted focus and we said, okay, now we've got to start to prove out the business. And fortunately, since then we've, you know, we've done, uh, I'd say quite well. So at least well enough where we feel like we're on a good trajectory. 
Um, but uh, yeah, that first 18 months, um, you know, I've got patient, uh, patient partners and a, and a wonderful wife. So without those, it would have been a, a, a tough ride. You know, I'm so glad you're saying that because many of our listener base are uh, CEOs of startups and entrepreneurs. And, you, you know, you, I, I love the way you give a real world example of, first of all, what it's like in the beginning. And second of all, how long things actually take. Um, you know, you, you can't just go into a business and in six months you're earning $20 million a year. I mean, it would be great if you are, but you know, the reality is, like you said, you have to focus on building up the platform and making sure that you can actually deliver value before you move to that next phase. Yeah, absolutely. And, and maybe one other um, piece of experience that might be useful for companies out there, you know, founders of, uh, of young companies. Uh, or, or people that are considering uh, starting a company. Um, and this is said by a lot of people, but I, so I can only, um, you know, I can only share my experience and, um, you know, reiterate, but uh, focus is super important when you're a young company and you're, um, you're trying to get, you know, your first customers and, and, um, uh, and basically prove out your, your basic business concept. Very easy to, um, brainstorm endlessly right you see this uh, kind of open sea of possibilities uh, it's quite easy to build out a kind of a marketing deck or a business plan around these different opportunities and pursue them um, this is something I'm, I'm quite guilty of and I think it's a little bit of like we all are. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of in- entrepreneurs are quite creative people so it's very natural for them to ideate and then as soon as they have an idea put in enough hours to basically mock that up and and let's say get the MVP out, but that's not enough, right? You can't just take the MVP, whether it's, you know, a consulting business or an IT business or a hardware business to market, you've got to actually build, a, you know, a real, a real solution. Um, and that requires focus, right? That requires saying, we've got these other hundred ideas, opportunities that we'll write down on a list, you know, somewhere and we'll explore them when it makes sense. And these are the three or the two or the one that we're going to put 100% of our focus in. And, and this is something that it sounds very intuitive. It's very difficult, I think, and let, you know, based on your mentality. But let's say for me, very difficult to, to focus. So again, fortunately, my, my colleagues have helped me with that. And my team has actually uh, been a great help there because they're always, every time I throw a new idea at them, they kind of look at me and like, Eric, is this, is this really something you want to pursue? Or is this just an idea that you have? And they force me to kind of second, uh, second check myself. It's definitely good to have people to bounce ideas off of, for sure. So Eric, this is a perfect segue into the next uh, question, which is, so you know the statistic that many small businesses fail within the first year of operation. Where do you think entrepreneurs go wrong with that? Yeah, I mean, so uh, the point I just made, focus, I think that's a big one, right? So. Um, if you're going to generate revenue relatively quickly, you got to be 100% focused because getting up to the point where you have a smooth sales process, where you, you're communicating in the right way, you know how to talk to customers, where your product is at a point where it can be delivered, all of this, um, it sounds easy. Uh, the execution is very hard. You should expect everything to fail the first couple times. So you're going to have to iterate and improve before it works. Everything from your product to your sales pitch to your, you know, your marketing material. Um, your execution. So um, that's huge. Uh, runway, I think um, a lot of people underestimate how much, you know, how much they need, how much they're going to burn just through the learning process. Um, and if you're self-funding, for example, um, and you have a very limited runway, uh, it's a very risky position. So, I mean, one thing that uh, companies can do in order to kind of let's say expand that runway is if you've already got a full-time job and you're you're considering setting uh, up a business try to get some work done while you're still getting that paycheck you know until you feel like okay I, you know I have based on the money I've got in the bank and the work that I've accomplished you know I've got enough runway to get this product out to market to fail once or twice and then to you know keep pushing through until I actually succeed um, because a lot of people I think um, 
yeah, they, they're optimistic around their, their ability to quickly put a product together, you know, work, uh, work lean and so forth. And, um, and then it's very unfortunate because a lot of companies, they don't die uh, because of bad ideas. I think, you know, very few companies die. They run out of money. They run out of money. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a good point you made. Not just, not just to estimate how much you need to get the product to market, but to fail one, two, three times until you get it right. And that could be, like you said, 12 to 18 months. It can be a while. So Eric, I love what you got going on here and the valuable service that IOT one is providing. Where do you, where are you looking to take this business say in the next five years? Yeah. So we've uh, recently decided to focus more on a couple of areas. Um, I mean, I guess to, to an extent, the areas that I outlined to you, I mean, we want to be um, the first source of information for people that are making decisions around IOT solutions, that they're coming to our website, they're asking us, you know, whether we're making money on that or not, not a big deal. We're very happy to make introductions to point people in the right direction. Uh, but we want to be, um, you know, top of mind when people are, are looking for guidance here. That's number one. Number two, um, entering into China. Um, I see huge opportunity for industrial software companies in China. This is a market that um, really hasn't uh, matured um, along with hardware. Hardware's a huge market in China, number one in many categories, but industrial software hasn't caught up. Um, it's now growing very, very quickly. And when you have all that hardware, um, you, you know, if you want to run it efficiently in a, in a factory and so forth, you need software, right? So um, companies are really starting to you know, appreciate the, the value of, of high quality uh, industrial software. So uh, growing our portfolio of companies that we represent in China is a big priority for us. And then number three, um, we are, we're setting up with a partner called Startup Factory, um, the, the Smart Factory Demonstration Center just outside of Shanghai. So this is going to be a 14,000 square meter um, demonstration center. Uh, it's right next to the factory. So we basically have the, the demo center where we'll be demonstrating technology, hosting workshops, trainings, um, companies can come through, they can play with the technology, tear it apart, um, ideate how can we use this in our, in our operations, how can we be, use business models around this. And then you can install the technology on the factory next door and see how does this actually work in an operating environment, talk to the engineers, you know, get their perspective on the ground, how are they working with it. So we're, we're super excited to be kicking this off and, um, and building a, a really um, you know, tactile um, uh, element to our business because our business is very, you know, relationship based and, and um, information based. But uh, one thing that we've realized is it's very difficult to communicate a lot of these technologies through, you know, through a PPT or a website or a conference call. Um, it's super helpful to be able to go somewhere, um, you know, and get on a computer you know, put some sensors on the table and, uh, and start playing with stuff and, you know, figuring out how it actually works. And so, so uh, that's uh, something we want to build up. And um, yeah, I think those will keep us busy. So um, we'll, we'll keep building the global, um, you know, the global brand, but uh, also investing very heavily in China. And when, uh, when are you uh, rolling out that uh, demo center? Yeah, I mean, we're kind of doing a soft launch now. So um, the demo center is being built now. It's going to take about 12 months to, uh, to you know, finish the building and get all the approvals. So that'll be launching in Q4 of next year. But we already have a 30,000 square meter um, factory uh, through our partner. There's 30 manufacturing, you know, manufacturers that are working there. We've got a ton of, um, of open space that we can use already for, um, for workshops and so forth and also for tech demo. So uh, we're already recruiting, we're, you know, we're starting with startups and, you know, getting startups in the door just so as a free service to them, they can, you know, they can get some visibility on their products. And it's great, you know, it's great for the, the companies that are there and the companies that visit to be exposed to this technology. So um, we're starting kind of in a, in a soft launch um, and we'll just ramp it up over the coming months. Wow, I'm definitely looking forward to that. So uh, when I uh, visit Shanghai, I will uh, check that out. Yeah, please. So, 
Eric, if you could rewind the clock, let's say 12 months, would there be anything differently that you do? Focus, you know, that would, but you know, then you have hindsight, right? So um, if I, you know, if I knew kind of what, you know, what has worked, I would certainly at that point, right. you know, cross everything off my to-do list and say, these are the three things that we're going to focus on. Now, it's easy to say that now, hard to say that at the time, because we don't know what is going to work. Um, but I would say that that would be generally it would be, I would, you know, slap myself in the face and say, uh, you know, prioritize, prioritize, prioritize. Um, and, you know, maybe that's through a, you know, a quick iteration process, um, you know, killing a lot of ideas after a quick trial. But uh, I think uh, that that's the main thing. Awesome. Now, what do you like doing for fun? Working, of course. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I'm from Portland, Oregon. So um, I love getting outdoors, uh, yeah, playing basketball and soccer and uh, hiking and um uh, love traveling. I mean, it is, you know, a bit of a challenge now. So, um, you know, I don't have as much time as I'd like, but still try to get out for long weekends, you know, get away. I'm going to Portland. Um, well, I'm actually going to San Francisco for a conference in a couple of weeks, but I'm going to swing through Portland for, you know, a weekend, spend some time with family. Um, that's it. You know, I, I just, uh, I just try to take it easy, keep my body fresh and hang out with friends and family. Beautiful. So Eric, we have a few questions from the audience. So I'm going to read you a couple of questions. Our first question is from Mark Richards. He's a reverse mortgage planner with Fairway Independent Mortgage in Ridgewood, New Jersey. And Mark asks, do you see an industry that is not a fit for IoT? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, it's a little bit like asking, is there an industry that's not a fit for the internet? And I think it would be hard to, hard to identify an industry that's not somehow using the internet today, right? Uh, but industries have adopted the internet at different time periods. So some finance, very quick, early adopter. Um, some, um, let's say, yeah, agriculture, um, maybe, um, maybe lag behind. So if we think of, let's say, a zoo, for example, right? The question is kind of when, when are these industries going to be able to build um, business cases where it's just, you know, it makes sense for them to adopt the technology and, and, um, and also when is the technology plug and play enough where the, the people in these industries who, you know, don't have the background are going to be able to adopt the technology, right? It's going to make sense to them and they're going to be able to install it and, and use it. So a zoo might be a good example where, um, the technology has to be pretty much plug and play probably for a zoo to adopt. The business model has to make tons of sense, which means, you know, the costs really have to come down. And then there will be sensors on animals. I mean, animals are expensive assets to an extent and you want to keep them healthy. So I'm sure zoos are already, you know, they're using things that are um, more manual to, um, you know, to keep the animals healthy and they'll, they'll start to turn to IOT, but that'll probably be a laggard. Uh, but I would say, if we look 50 years out, I think every industry to a greater or less extent will be just as they're all using the internet. Um, but then next five years, yeah, there's going to be a lot of industries where the business case just doesn't make sense yet. Great. And I've got this image in my mind of a monkey with an IOT sensor uh, measuring uh, where exactly it's climbing and uh, geofencing it so that it doesn't escape. Yeah, I got to optimize those monkey uh, playgrounds. <laughs> Our next question is from Bill Corley. He's a technical engineer in the telecommunications industry in Piscataway, New Jersey. And Bill asked, how are we going to educate the consumer on the IoT and the security required? Yeah, that's a big challenge. I mean, um, you know, especially if we're talking about actual consumer consumers, so uh, people instead of uh, businesses. Um, because businesses are a little bit easier to to educate, they're willing to schedule a meeting and uh, and have a have a talk about it. Uh, consumers, uh, um, unless you make it into a super sexy advertisement, very hard to get any attention. So, um, you know, my my feeling on the consumer side is we the solution can't be to educate the consumer, right? I, I don't think that um, that's a viable solution. Um, it's just not a task that any one company can take on. 
um, educating, educating consumers and um, it needs to be, how do we build solutions that an uneducated you know, consumer um, cannot uh, you know, misuse, cannot make a mistake. So how do we not allow people to use the default password, right? Not allow people to put their password as one, two, three, four, five, six, um, and so forth. So I, I would say that's the direction we need to go in. A lot of companies then uh, they need to educate themselves, right? The, a lot of companies need to change their, their behaviors and, um, and start to implement some of the best practices that I think are already fairly well proven out, um, but just are not implemented because they cost a bit of money. My, my assumption is that we're gonna see more hacks, we're gonna see um, you know, lawsuits attached to those, and then companies are gonna start to take this more seriously, and, and that's gonna be the major motivator. Yeah, for sure. And we'll see, we'll see how GDPR uh, mo starts motivating businesses as well. Yeah, exactly. All right. So our next question is from Lauren Keeson, who is the CEO and publisher of Disruptive Technologists in New York City. Lauren asks, how can IoT aid cities and governments with their connectivity to everything? Yeah, I mean... I think there's some um, use cases in a city that make quite a bit of sense. Uh, but I think this, this concept of um, a city connecting everything, I think that's actually a, a problem, right? That city governments need to um, move away from this, this high level, we need to connect our city, we need to be a smart city, and focus more on what are problems that your city has that you can solve with new technology, right? Um, so we have high traffic fatality rate, or we have bottlenecks in our city where traffic congestion is very bad, and we want to reduce that congestion. So um, how can you make your, your citizens happier? And then how can technology or IoT technology help you to do that? Because if it's around connecting, I think uh, Cisco, I think it was, just put out a, um, a report earlier this year that said 75% of IoT deployments have failed to achieve their objectives. And I think one of the big reasons is that a lot of leaders, especially in the smart city space, maybe don't really have objectives, right? They have the broad concept of, we wanna be a smart city, we need to connect something. Um, and then they say, okay, how can we connect as much as possible on a limited budget? Okay, let's buy you know, cheap uh, you know, consumer grade uh, technology and let's go for budget uh, implementation and these system graders are too expensive. Who, you know, um, and, and because of a lack of focus, they, they do a kind of a distributed system and they don't get real results. Um, I would say the big thing, let's look at it incrementally, um, prioritize the, the biggest problems that your city faces, uh, problems that might have been around for decades, and think, does the technology that's come to market in the past few years, does that allow us to address those problems in a new way? And then explore that technology. So I think with um, traffic, for example. There's some great new technologies, a lot of uh, innovation going into that space. Um, in China, there's a great example of a, um, let's see, so there's a big problem in China, migratory um, populations that are, you know, moving out to the coastal areas to work in factories, and then they leave their children back home, and the children are separated from their parents. They often, you know, they can be abused, they can uh, get depressed, they can, um, you know, get into trouble. Um, they, they're basically, you know, kind of in, in drift. And so the government there is giving them connected uh, watches, right? So they can, you know, push this button, talk to your mom, push that button, talk to your dad, push that button, talk to grandma, push this button if you're in trouble and it'll call the police. And so then these kids, I mean, this is not the ideal solution. It's a tough problem, right? Um, that, you know, the ideal solution is the parents live with them, right? But that's not, that's just not viable. So at least this technology now allows the kids to connect with their parents and not feel like there's this always this distance. And if they get in trouble, they can call somebody. So I think that's an interesting solution where, you know, it's not obvious, but the government said, we've got a big problem here and we've got a new technology you might be able to help us solve the problem. And they're, they're giving it a try. Really good point there. Our next question is from Mohan G who's a sales consultant in Hyderabad, India. Mohan asks, what is the best approach to ensure digital trust in the smart city IoT era? I, I don't think there is a best approach. You know, I don't think that there is um, 
um, a best practice. I think the closest thing we have to best practices are some some white papers that have been put out from guys like Cisco or the Industrial Internet Consortium and and so forth. And um, I think the best approach really is, you know, as I just said, identify a specific uh, use case and then work with your partners to do a full evaluation of, you know, what are the uh, potential um, risk factors that could compromise this, whether it's human error, hacking, industrial espionage, w- whatever it is, how can we reduce these risk factors? And it's going to be a completely different set of technologies for many different use cases, right? So there's, there's certainly no kind of out of the box, either best approach or best technology on the market. It's uh, very fragmented. Okay, great. And uh, another question asked by Mon is, the in-car technology is pretty much there in terms of both connected and autonomous vehicles, but there's still a lot to be done in terms of roadside infrastructure. With faster wireless technology and obvious limitations to the traditional roadside messaging systems, such as your view being blocked, do you foresee smarter vehicles displaying travel updates and warnings on their dashboards? We, we kind of have that already, right? So we already have some visual um, cues in the car that, you know, there's objects behind you or uh, so forth. I think, I think certainly um, we'll see this. We're, we're already seeing a lot more use of screens to display information, which, uh, I mean, one, one of the big things that we've seen, um, not just automotive manufacturers, but in general manufacturers do is try to take the, um, let's say the value creating elements. So the user interface, the analytics, the, the visualization out of the hardware um, so that they're, you know, the traditional model is you install something in, in a dashboard and it sits there for the life of the car. And it's very difficult and expensive to change it because it's part of the vehicle. It's a piece of hardware that has some, some glass and some lights and so forth. Um, take that out and just put a flat screen and you can update the, you know, you can update the analytics, you can update the visualization and so forth every, whatever, every day, every week, every month, every year. And then it becomes much more easy to, uh, to implement these types of solutions because when a new visualization comes out, there's no hardware update. It's a virtually free kind of over the air software update. Just, just buy the SAS and maybe that costs you $10 a year or something to use that program. So uh, I think we'll certainly see it, but we, we need a change in hardware. Um, and that's, yeah, that's coming down the pipe. Awesome. It'll be interesting to see all this new technology. So, Eric, I know you're a busy guy. We're going to let you go just a bit. Uh, but just before we do, how do people connect with you? Let's see. They can certainly find me on LinkedIn. Uh, they can email me at uh, eric.walenza at iot1.com, or they can email kind of us more generally at team at iot1.com. Um, I'm quite accessible, so I'll reach out if you're if you're interested in learning more about the space, or um, you know, entering into China, or if you're just in Shanghai. I've got a pretty good connection among uh, entrepreneurs as well as the um, the IoT community here. So always happy to make introductions. And I'll put that in the show notes that people can just click on that and get right to you. Great. Eric, do you have any parting words of wisdom to share with the audience? Focus. Love that. (laughs) That says it all. Eric, thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom. I really enjoyed having you today. Yeah, thank you. I enjoyed the discussion. Uh,